Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to, to session two of Accession Week. Uh, my name is Michael Shikawa, Director of Accession Division. So this morning, uh, we have started this Accession Week. Um, you know, this is uh, basically a week-long series of 10 webinars. We have one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and 10 webinars consist of a training, like uh, this session. We also have a dialogue roundtable on the issue of interest to anyone interested in WTO accession, whether for accessing government, or WTO members, um, any stakeholder outside of uh, government, civil society, academia, private sector. So this morning, uh, we had a high level opening. Um, the session was called the present and future value of the WTO membership. Uh, we organized with uh, in our research division. Uh, for that session, we had a WTO Deputy Director General Alan Wolf. We had also Ambassador Aichanaba of Kazakhstan, who used to be the chief negotiator of Kazakhstan's accession. We also had Ms. Luis Santo, uh, Deputy Director General of Business Europe. And we also had the Professor Monica Razadba from the University of Geneva, and the session was moderated by our chief economist, Bob Cookman. So I think it was a very good substantive session, you know, speakers providing different perspective on the value of WTO membership, whether institution, whether, you know, Kazakhstan, which is a member recently acceded to the WTO almost five years ago, and then business, private sector, and academia. If you missed that session, which we had a good participate, a good number of participants, uh, the recording of the session will be made available on the WTO website shortly. So in this session, session two, we will provide um, an overview of WTO accession. And my colleague, uh, Dimita uh, Bratanov, will be doing the presentation. So I have an easy part. Uh, so Dimitar is a uh, longest serving staff uh, in the accession division and he joined the division in 2004. So all the accession probably will be discussing today, he had one way or another has dealt in his career. So this afternoon, at least in the Geneva time, uh, his uh, presentation will have a four component covering the basic procedure and second, track record to date. And third, uh, state of play in ongoing accession. And lastly, what is expected of accessing government. Since there are over 40 slides, uh, we decided to probably make you know, this session into four parts. So this means that the following Dimitar's presentation on the, each of the four four component, I will open the floor for any questions and the comments so that we can respond to them immediately before we move to the next component. So if you have a question, please write them down in the Q&A box, which you see in the bottom of your screen. So for each session, my plan is not to spend, you know, really more than 20 minutes, meaning that 10 minutes presentation by Dimita, followed by Q&A of about 10 minutes. So at the end, hopefully this will allow us to have a time to respond to any of the question participant may have, maybe not on the issue we covered uh, this afternoon in the presentation. So maybe with this uh, short introduction, I will give the floor to Dimita. Thank you, Micah, and uh, good afternoon to our attendees here from Geneva. Um, I know that some of you are joining us from around the world, so thank you for being with us today. This new virtual format allows us to reach more people, hopefully in a more effective manner as well. Um, before further ado, I, I think I'll just move to the presentation I've prepared. Um, and we'll try to 
share the screen with you. I hope you can see this. As Micah mentioned, I'll divide this presentation in four parts uh, with the basic procedures underlying its session being the first one. This way, hopefully, um, all of us will be on the same page um, once we get to the uh, perhaps more technical aspects of the dialogue today. So the basic procedures of accession negotiations to the WTO. At the outset, um, before addressing the accession process per se, it is perhaps useful to, to remember that the two types of relationships that governments that are still on the outside of the multilateral trading system can seek to have with the WTO. Um, there is, of course, the uh, request for accession under Article 12, which will eventually lead to membership. Uh, and there is also something called the request for observer status in the General Council and the subsidiary bodies. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this up front is because we currently actually have uh, a case which falls into that category. We'll come back to this later. So both of these channels are uh, a valid way in to the multilateral trading system. Um, I'll start with the observer status. Requests for observer status are actually uh, made under the um, following the procedures that apply for, for sessions of the Ministerial Conference and the General Council of the WTO. And um, according to these guidelines, interested governments have to uh, make a request, provide a short description of their economic and trade policies, including a description of their intention for future reforms. And they will need to make, uh, to show intent to initiate accession negotiations for real this time uh, within five years. So this is meant to be a sort of a probationary period during which uh, those who are interested but have not taken the formal step yet to, to seek WTO membership may, uh, come in and, and follow the work of the WTO so that they can learn about the inner workings of the system. So far, we've had 10 governments that have been granted such observer status under these procedures. It has not been used too often, this, uh, this procedure. We're looking at 10 governments out of, we, we've had 36 plus 23, almost 60 governments that uh, are today have been through the accession process or currently in the accession process. So 10 of them at some point had been observers. Um, and this is not to be mistaken with another uh, observership, which is just an ad hoc one-off observership status given for WTO ministerial conferences that is only uh, available for the duration of the ministerial conference. So um, we have currently a government that has expressed its interest to be an observer under these procedures as the government of Turkmenistan. And all going well, they, uh, they have put in a request which will then be reviewed by members at the next meeting of the WTO General Council in July. Now, moving back to the process of WTO accession, uh, as some of you may know, it's governed by uh, an instrument called Article 12 of the agreement establishing the WTO, the Marrakesh Agreement. Um, this is it, I've reproduced it on the screen. It's the, uh, the entirety of Article 12 uh, that governs the accession process. It is very brief and I have highlighted just the, uh, perhaps some of the more salient points, any separate customs territory or state uh, possessing full autonomy can um, apply to, 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 to join the WTO on terms to be agreed. And this will be subject to a two thirds majority vote. Now I'll break these down for you. Um, by two thirds majority vote, just to dispel this, sometimes we get questions, actually often we get questions about this voting procedure. We, we don't really do voting, uh, just like um, 
in the rest of the WTO, members like to operate by consensus. So this has been reaffirmed in practice in the accessions that we've had. So uh, consensus rulemaking has been the norm since 1995. And of course, when we say that decisions on accessions will be taken by the ministerial conference or the general council, as we saw in article 12, we are referring not to decisions on an ongoing basis during the process, we are referring to the final decision, which takes place after um, an accession file has been reviewed and recommendations have been made. So this uh, decision is taken by the ministerial conference or the general council in between sessions of the ministerial conference. Now, on terms to be agreed, it's a tricky little phrase because it means everything uh, or nothing, depending on, on which way you want to see it. Uh, what it has meant in practice is that uh, each accession negotiation has produced specific terms for accession to the WTO, for entry into the WTO. Uh, so we can say that each of the 36 successfully concluded accessions has produced unique results in many ways. Um, their commonalities, we'll have a look at those later, but when you break it down to the specifics, we do have 36 unique discrete packages. Now, why is that? Why is the fundamental uh, legal reference so vague, one may, one may ask? Um, there are many reasons. I've just listed some of them here. Uh, this is by no means exhaustive and it's by no means definitive. Uh, off the top of my head, um, we, uh, we, we do know that countries have different legal institutional economic frameworks um, and uh, the, this open wording on terms to be agreed accommodates for that, that each accession negotiation will be tailor-made um, for the specifics of each exceeding government. Um, as we'll see uh, in a minute, accessions, negotiations at the WTO are member-led, they're member-driven. It is not the Secretariat, myself and my colleagues, uh, who are negotiating with uh, governments wishing to become members of the WTO, which may be the case perhaps in other institutions. Here, the, uh, the process is entirely led by WTO member governments. So um, their interests, of course, are different. We have 164 members currently, they all have varying interests. And this is reflected perhaps in the accession packages that are negotiated with each existing government. Uh, and then other reasons include the fact that the WTO book of rules, the rule book has not stayed uh, stagnant for the entirety of the existence of the WTO since 1995. There have been additions. Also, the WTO has had various accomplishments. I refer to those as our a key over the years. And accessions negotiations have tended to reflect those. And as we'll see later on, sometimes they have even tended to lead the way uh, in areas where multilateral decision-making had, uh, had not yet um, produced results. In accessions, the interests of WTO members have already been expressed in certain areas. So on terms to be agreed, uh, takes into account all these uh, variables. Now, bear in mind that although the specific terms of accession are ultimately different in each of the 36 accessions that we've had today and in the future ones that we'll have, um, the process itself, the procedures, have remained largely unchanged since the inception of the WTO in 1995, which is the time at which those procedures were developed in the first place. Um, so here it is, it's the WTO accession process. We can identify roughly speaking three stages. Uh, there's perhaps a lot of information on, on this one slide and we can talk about this for hours, which is not the purpose of what we're doing here today. In fact, I'm going to wrap up the uh, first part of the presentation in, the in a few minutes uh, and to allow for possible questions. But still, I'll try to give you a general overview. Perhaps you can think of stage one as the um, initial 
the political will of a government that wishes to become joint WTO being expressed formally through a letter sent to the WTO. Um, we hereby wish to become members under Article 12. Uh, that's all it takes, really. And um, if there is consensus among the WTO members, 164 of them, um, the request is then formally considered by the WTO decision-making body, the General Counsel, uh, in, uh, in this case, for the vast majority of cases. So the second stage is where the substantive negotiations take place once a working party to examine the request for accession is established. As we'll see in a minute, there are many elements to this stage. It can be very lengthy. And when the technical work, the substantive work is complete, in some cases after many, many years, we get to stage three, which in my slide takes up half the page perhaps, but in reality, uh, we cross those final steps in just a few months in most cases, where the final set of documents is put together by the Secretariat, which captures all the discussions or uh, the key elements of the discussions and oh, commitments that have been agreed during each accession process and a number of formal steps are followed, which lead to the uh, acceptance of the uh, terms of entry by both the WTO, members offer the terms of entry to the exceeding government and then to the exceeding government um, and then they become a new member of the WTO. In three slides, I've broken these three steps down into a tiny bit of more detail and I think it may be of interest to some of the, our attendees today just because we currently have um, for example, uh, a number of governments that are at this stage, stage one, where the working party has recently been established. The most recent one of those is Curacao, um, where the working party established only in March um, this year. So, as I mentioned before, it is the decision-making body, the general counsel, that sets up the WTO body called an accession working party that examines the request. Each working party is, in fact, made up of those who are interested in the issue. Although the WTO has 164 members, we never have 164 members collectively examining an accession request. In practice, we've had somewhere in the range of perhaps 10 members to 60, 70 members, I would say, um, depending on the interest there is in the given accession, joining a, uh, an accession working party. They can join at any point in time. It doesn't need to be at the outset. It could be uh, later in the process. And of course, as new exceeding governments become members, they're often tempted to join other ongoing accession working parties, just as one example of how these are bodies uh, in which membership is open for the duration of the process. Uh, another question we often get, and that's why I'm mentioning this upfront, is the chairperson. Each accession working party, just like each WTO body, has a chairperson that leads the work and sets the tone um, for discussions. In the case of accessions, the practice has evolved over time that we appoint the WTO general counsel, um, selects a chairperson, and consultations for that begin uh, after all the documents necessary for holding an initial meeting of the working party are in place. So Curacao, Working Party established in March. So far, no documents have been submitted, which means that there is no active consultation uh, for the role of the chairperson, the position of the chairperson. The other two elements that I've listed here is that by virtue of becoming an exceeding government, governments get an observer status, meaning they can attend all meetings, or formal meetings of the um, WTO bodies. Uh, they receive documents, they receive technical assistance. And finally, there's a financial contribution which needs to be paid on an annual basis, uh, around 30,000 Swiss francs. Stage two, the fact finding and negotiation stage, sometimes very lengthy, could be divided into two main tracks, multilateral negotiations within the working party, which take place with all WTO members uh, collectively who are in the working parties. So the focus here is on uh, 
examining the uh, legislation and regulations of the exceeding government, seeing to what extent they are or not in conformity with the WTO standards, and agreeing on the necessary adjustments that will need to take place. Bilateral negotiations focus on market access, on goods and services. So those are taken up bilaterally by each interested member with the exceeding government. And here we're discussing tariffs on, on the goods side and access to services markets on the services side. And for the record, I should also mention that in many cases in accessions, we also have what we call plurilateral discussions uh, on given topics. Mo most often this is agriculture, uh, domestic support to agriculture, where those members interested in that specific issue get together in a smaller subset uh, of members to explore this issue with the exceeding government. All this work proceeds in parallel. Um, the process that is most commonly used is questions and replies. Members asking questions, the exceeding government providing answers. This is also the case on the bilateral side when we're dealing with market access. Members are making a request uh, for a certain level of market access. The exceeding government is making offers um, to um, provide this access once a WTO member. All these procedures, I'm not going to spell it out any further, are outlined in a document. The reference is on the screen down there. It is document WTACC 22 revision one. It has been updated over the years, so this is fairly up to date, um, this document here. And um, yeah, just to say that this is a practical non-binding guide. It, it does not in any way uh, preclude or prejudge any particular outcome uh, or any particular steps to be followed in a given accession process. So finally, if I move to the last slide I think I have in this initial part of my presentation, we get to the final steps. Um, the various documents that results from an accession process, we refer to them as the accession package. Um, and the main elements of that package are the um, report of the working party here, and the schedules on concessions and commitments on goods and the schedule specific commitments on services. When you look at that photo at the bottom, this is actually from the Russian Federation's accession. It gives you a, a sense of how voluminous this could be. Um, it's not always the case. So uh, don't despair if you are government officials that will be uh, doing this in the future or currently are engaged in the process of accession. It does not need to be that voluminous, but it can be. Um, these documents capture the results of the negotiations and discussions. On top of those documents, we add what we could call here a cover page called the protocol of accession, which is a uh, modern cover page, of course, is the instrument with which all this becomes legally binding. And it goes through a formal, well, first a, a vote at the level of the working party and then formally at the level of the general council or ministerial conference. When I say a vote, I mean consensus, as I explained earlier on. Um, after that, it's up to the exceeding government to approve what is on offer from the WTO. This is done through either a process of domestic ratification, or if the constitutional arrangements are different, it could also be done directly through signature. And uh, finally, the WTO is notified of the good news and the new member joins the WTO as a new member 30 days after notifying us of the acceptance. I think this is all I had to say in this preliminary part of my presentation. So I am not sure if there are any questions at this stage. Perhaps Micah could guide me on this one. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dimita, for really to laying out the accession process, starting with uh, you know, the difference between observer status and Article 12 procedure decision-making in the legal basis and the accession process, stage one to three. Uh, so it was, I think, quite uh, comprehensive. Um, I think we have received three questions. Uh, please do feel free to ask more. I think the first two one is certainly quite uh, straightforward. 
first question whether we will make these slides available. Yes, I will, we will definitely make, do that immediately after this session too. Second question uh, is that annual financial contribution of a uh, Swiss franc 30,000 is a flat fee regardless of whether exceeding government is uh, developed or developing or LDCs? The answer is yes. Maybe let me add here that uh, what is the consequence if you do not pay uh, this fee on the annual basis? And I have to admit there are several exceeding government is in career. I think probably the biggest disadvantage is that then um, you will lose access to technical assistance and uh, you know training opportunity provided by the WTO secretariat. And I think what that's um, I think it quite uh, it's quite unfortunate you know when you are in the process of accession I and mean, accession you know is negotiation is a quite a complex and then, you know, many accident government do feel that they do not always have the capacity. And if you actually then lose this capacity building opportunity, uh, the damage is uh, quite big. Let, so let me move to the third question and then, okay, let me read. So it is good news that Turkmenistan will be like to be observer. I think as um, Dimitar mentioned, we have received a request to become observer from Turkmenistan recently. And this request will be considered at upcoming meeting of the general council, which is scheduled for 22 and 23 July. What do you think, how much the country is serious about the membership? What can we expect Turkmenistan will be the member around five years? And I think there's also, uh, maybe let's start with that. Dimitra, do you want to start on this one, on Turkmenistan? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Micah. Uh, generally, um, an observer, the, the period of observership is five years, it could be renewed. So at the end of the five years, what could happen is that Turkmenistan may request for it to be extended and um, typically this has been uh, given by WTO members. Uh, but in most cases, what happens in practice is that governments that are observers convert their observer status into um, an application for accession. So formal negotiations begin. Uh, whether or not they're serious, uh, I think uh, it is, a big decision for every government to consider joining the WTO. So uh, it is very understandable that they like to take this into separate steps. This is an instrument that's been used by many. So I think that they, it, this looks pretty serious to me. Uh, thank you, Dimitar. Let me just add on Turkmenistan. I think uh, Turkmenistan has been quite serious about uh, uh, this observer request. Uh, the government actually established an uh, intergovernmental commission to study WTO accession already in 2013 in January. I myself have been to Turkmenistan twice, most recently last August, and met with the entire member of the commission. And then, then they have been elaborating on this question for the at least last seven years. So I do think it's, this is a very serious and that we very much welcome the government interest in the WTO uh, observer status. I'm looking at the other questions, but maybe also interest of time, probably we better move to the next part of the presentation. And then, uh, because I think some of them will be answered in the following presentation. Um, Dimitar, are you ready for the second part? Yes. Okay, go ahead. The track record to date, um, I'll try to erase my failed attempt at an annotation first. <laughs> now, here we are today uh, in 2020, the WTO is made up of 164 members and um, of which a fifth, 36 have come through the accession process and another 23 are currently in this process of accession. So when you do the math, if this is where it ends, and it certainly wouldn't, you see the other newcomers such as Turkmenistan, will be uh, 
probably approaching a third of the WTO membership um, that has come through this process of accession, um, which is quite significant because we will have two thirds of the WTO membership that came in as original members in 1995 with uh, the WTO rulebook, the way it was and the commitments, the way they applied at the time. And then another one third of the WTO membership, which has come through this a very different process that we are discussing today. Uh, in blue and green, sorry, in green and uh, yellow are the, uh, the countries that, or the, um, the governments that I've been uh, discussing now. There's very little gray left on the map, as you can see. So this is to put words behind the images. This is the universe that we are talking about, 36 completed and 23 ongoing accessions. Many of them have been these developed countries. They're highlighted in red. By region, our main customers, if you will, have been uh, uh, Europe and the CIS, which is not a surprise because a lot of the work that came to the WTO and the accessions division was generated by the breakup of the former Soviet Union and former Yugoslavia. So the resulting entities applied separately for, for membership. So this has generated a lot of, a lot of uh, work as you can see from this slide. And uh, some of the other regions where we've had a lot of activity, uh, Africa, Asia Pacific. Currently from the ongoing accessions, there are quite a few from the uh, Middle East and Arab region. What has been done so far? This is just the timeline for those of you who are interested. I won't uh, spell things out for you. Most recently, we've had Liberia and Afghanistan become members in 2016, uh, and we've not had another accession in the last four years. Um, this will hopefully change soon. Now we can have a quick look about Perhaps I mentioned that a fifth of the WTO membership is composed currently of countries, governments that have come through this, members who have come through this process of negotiated accession. Um, this is also reflected over time. It has become reflected in the share of world trade. We have 17.8%, which is close to a fifth of, of world trade that is actually contributed by these members, newer members that have negotiated their accession through Article 12. This is quite significant uh, and it can tell you many things uh, or could hint at many things. If you look at that group of 36 countries uh, and you look at 1995, at the inception of the WTO, of course, they were all not in the WTO at the time, uh, they, uh, their economies contributed barely 8% of all trade. Today, these 36 having gone through a process of accession, their economies contribute about a fifth, 17.8% of uh, world trade. And um, original members have gone down, conversely from close to 89% down to 80. So it's quite significant, the contribution of, of this process, this process to WTO accession. So just a few very visual aids that make two points. So I would not go over each individual chart now. I'll just generally observe that what we see when we plot data is that countries tend to perform better after they've completed their process of accession than before their accession. Of course, these are cumulative, cumulative effects that we're looking at. Uh, it's not in any given year that something spectacular happens since not necessarily the date of accession itself either, but over time we can see trends. So when you look at uh, indicators, all the major ones that are typically used, GDP, gross domestic product, inward foreign direct investment, uh, merchandise trade, services trade, we tend to see that those who have come from a process of negotiating accession have tended to grow faster by those indicators. Those indicators have grown faster after accession than before. So maybe WTO accession is doing something there. 
maybe it's helping them grow faster or these indicators grow faster. We can, of course, not prove it by just plotting down the data. We cannot say that this is causation, but we can uh, certainly observe this trend. Um, and the other observation we can make from these charts is that Article 12 members, those who have negotiated their membership to the WTO, have tended to also outperform the growth of other members or the rest of the world in this case uh, we've used as a proxy so uh, you see the uh, the gap between the two um, charts there to two lines so here we're looking at merchandise exports uh, imports services and services the picture is a bit more mixed um, there are two slides that we have for services because of data issues so uh, but generally it's still supportive of the idea that uh, accession leads to also positive growth. Uh, foreign direct investment, you can also see the same, the same thing prior to accession versus after accession, growth is much higher, which is what we say um, that countries tend to do without having the numbers necessary. They like to be in the WTO to attract foreign direct investment to help grow their economies, um, help foreign investments be reassured that they're part of a brand name and a club that is recognized. So uh, the last slide that I have here is with these, um, how should I call it, columns on the right. I would not discuss the technical detail of how this was put together, but what it shows is that when you look at the World Bank doing business reports, they have a set of indicators that they use to assess how the business environment is in countries and they track this over time, you see that for the countries for which there was data at least, accession has tended to improve the business environment. This is what this says, that already during accession, we notice a positive development and certainly after accession, uh, we notice that for a range of indicators that the, the World Bank is tracking called the DTF, uh, distance to frontier, and these are things like uh, how easy it is to set up a business, how easy it is to do a uh, cross-border trade. Um, there are 10 indicators like that. Across many of them, there are marked improvements. So this is what we, we see. Uh, I'll stop there with the track record to date. Uh, it looks like our 36 new members have, uh, by looking at the data, have benefited certainly from having gone through this process. I will stop here and I will see if there are any questions. Um, thank you, uh, Dimitar. On the, you know, this was a little bit shorter, I think, on the pr short presentation on accession result based on 36 accession completed to date. Uh, I'm looking at the question and maybe some of them, uh, maybe it's linked to previous uh, session, but I think it's maybe worthwhile responding to. So this is from a, so one from Lee from a Mission of Korea. So we've been working together. So, you know, if you could elaborate, you know, I think element of the draft working party report, you know, and probably what is the difference between draft working party report and um, MFTR, Memorandum on the Foreign Trade Regime, and then how the domestic legislation sort of a process, you know, uh, feed into that documentation. Yes, certainly. And this is something that we'll go back to in the last segment of my presentation. The next segment, we'll just look at the state of play in ongoing accessions in the 23 that we're working on now. And then we'll go back to, um, to dissecting a bit more closely the elements of accession in the final segment. So uh, to your specific question about the general contents of a working party report, um, perhaps versus a memorandum on the foreign trade regime, all these are key documents in each accession process. Um, the memorandum on the foreign trade regime is the initial document that needs to be tabled so that work can begin in each accession. Uh, there is no ex exception. This covers the full range. It's in, it's in the title, Memorandum on the Foreign Trade Regime. 
Um, it covers the full range of topics that will be explored in each accession negotiation. And it already provides the broader framework for discussions, which will then retain in subsequent discussions and documents that are produced. This document is typically produced just the one time at the beginning of the accession process. It provides a snapshot of where the uh, applicant is at the moment when they're applying for accession, or certainly at the moment when they want, when they're ready to have a first working party meeting. And um, members review this text and ask an initial set of questions, trying to identify areas which perhaps um, appear to be not in conformity with WTO rules, areas where not enough information has been provided. Um, and this list of questions is then shared with the exceeding government and they have to provide replies. Uh, after that, we can have a first working party meeting. Then this process of questions and replies is repeated as long as it takes. Um, at some point, enough information is on the table. So then we put together the uh, working party report is the document that you're referring to. Ultimately, this is what we produce. In many, many cases, uh, and in more recent times, in all cases, we produce an intermediate document, which is called a factual summary, which looks exactly like the report. It's just that it's a more informal document and perhaps focusing on fact finding rather than negotiation. It captures the facts rather than capturing the um, negotiated outcomes, which are over time also edit. Uh, and this is when we start referring to this text as the draft working party report. You may remember, we may recall that this is one of the key documents that form the accession package at the end. So um, the working party report, like the, foreign, the memorandum on the foreign trade regime, covers the full spectrum of issues that are being discussed uh, and captures the discussions that have taken place, the key points of the discussions that have taken place in the working party. The working party, you recall, is the body that examines each individual request for accession. So uh, it's a secretariat, it's myself and my colleagues who are responsible for uh, putting this document together and we try to faithfully reproduce the positions of both members who are asking the questions and the exceeding governments who are providing the answers. And uh, this document then gets revised over time to reflect the uh, status of discussions. I hope this has been helpful. Yes, thank you, Dimitar. Um, you know, we have received uh, several questions on the, this uh, session, but um, let me try to pick a few of them, or probably not all of them. Also, I want to be sure that we cover the rest of the presentations. So, um, regarding a question regarding the growth rate of the goods and services and FDI, uh, after members accession, is there any example stay unchanged or even declined? Uh, yeah, very quickly. Yes, what I showed you are averages. So, um, this seems to be on balance what has happened. And each uh, economy that we plotted to compile those charts is treated in the same way as the next. So we have China contributing, sort of, we have the, uh, <laughs> the information for China uh, treated in the same way as the information for the smallest, least developed countries that have a, uh, very small economies. So uh, we have averaged all that information. So in a way, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. We're not weighing a large economy like China uh, differently. But of course, when you look at the individual data at the country by country level, yeah, uh, there are examples of uh, those where um, not all the indicators have evolved positively. And as you saw briefly in the case of services for um, the more recent period, we don't even have uh, that much of a positive story to tell, even when you look at the averages. But I think on balance, the overwhelming reading 
is that there seems to be something good happening. Whether or not it's the process of accession that is solely responsible for that, we may never know. Or we can certainly ask our colleagues from economic research to help us redefine uh, and uh, refocus our examination. But it's very difficult to, to, to prove causation. But on balance, it looks like a good thing. Thank you, Dimitar. Um, if you are interested among the audience, uh, this how we compile this data, we do this in our D, uh, Director General Issues um, Annual Report on WTO Accession, and each year we update the numbers. So if you are interested in the specific economic performance of a specific uh, country which has gone through the process, uh, please have a look at our annual report. Um, I'm trying to pick something a little bit also relevant and this is also another question I'm often asked is uh, are there empirical research done on the benefit of uh, accession to the newly WTO member other than I think what we have uh, presented especially you know country like uh, Vietnam. Um, Dimita do you want to start that? And then after that, maybe probably we should move to. Yeah. Uh, yes, there, there is. There is a lot of literature on the benefits of accession, including for countries like Vietnam and Vietnam in particular, there is uh, several studies. Again, I, I, uh, I encourage you to look out for those. If you're completely lost, maybe you can also ask us directly and we try to guide you. Like with anything, um, these studies tell a different story every time based on different assumptions, based on different variables. So you have to really read them to the extent possible as an informed reader to try and also um, distill the information that is uh, of interest to you. So there is a lot out there. Yeah. No, thank you, Dimitar. Yes, I think apart from our annual report, we also have, uh, you know, publication on the WT, um, on WTO accession. It's a huge book of 1,000 pages and it has a, you know, different, it covers different issues or different experiences of different accession, including accession result. So um, you could find some of the, uh, the result, benefit of accession in this publication and then I think other than apart from us uh, you know such as World Bank, uh, Asian Development Bank, they have been producing uh, several good study. Uh, recently I have seen one for the Bahamas and I do encourage for those countries who are going through the accession process to actually also try to get these studies done uh, as you proceed uh, accession process. Um, I think probably we should, there are some Maybe more, yeah. there is one very quickly we can cover because it was already in the initial slides about the chairperson. Okay. Uh, what are the criteria for the eligibility to be a working party chairperson? Just to say okay. that uh, chairpersons of WTO bodies are uh, nominated by their government. So the member governments of WTO, 164 of them. If there is interest, they just put forward uh, a name of their representative and those names are, are then considered. So eligibility, uh, when the names are being considered, of course, people are aware of the, of the CVs that are also behind. So it needs to be a representative of a member government is the answer in short. No, thank you very much. And I think just to add also expectation is that person is based in Geneva. Okay, I think uh, now you could move on to the next part on the state of play. State of play. Um, again, this will be a very short segment uh, and I'll leave it to questions to fill the time. 23 ongoing accessions currently. We are happy again to note that in 2020 we have uh, welcomed another uh, client of the accessions division, Curacao. This is a summary view of where each of our 23 accession files dossiers stands at present. 
it follows roughly the same design as that initial tracker image I showed you with the different phases. So from left to right, you're moving further afield. So the ones that are to the right are more advanced, uh, uh, relatively speaking, in their accession process. Of course, we've added another field for Turkmenistan. As I mentioned before, they have just submitted an application for observership. So very preliminary stages there. Uh, working party established, but hasn't met yet, meaning that not all documents are in place. Uh, we have five governments in that situation, Curacao, Equatorial Guinea, Libya, Sao Tome, and the Syrian Arab Republic. Uh, bear in mind that although they have been in that category, therefore, in some cases, a number of years, unlike yourself, they have been having to pay, in principle, their membership, uh, observership uh, fees. So they accumulate over time. And this is something that Michael referred to uh, earlier, that it's to be avoided. Once you get, once you've taken the decision to join, uh, it just becomes, uh, it needs to be a continuous process, hopefully. Then, the initial stages, you see uh, the countries in the middle of the table. I should point out that the ones with an asterisk are LDCs, least developed countries. Many, many countries are now in this category, as you see, the bulk, which is a good thing. And, um, and then um, we don't have a, a, a exceeding government that is in the very final stages. As you can see, there are no draft goods and services schedules prepared for any of the exceeding governments. And I think this may be the last slide in this section, which perhaps for some of you who, are, who would like, like to learn about the state of play is the most informative one. So I'll just leave it on the screen. Uh, I'll just check if, okay, there's one more slide after this, but this is the one that will give you the succinct information of where we stand on a country by country basis. I'll just highlight a few elements before uh, giving the floor back to Micah and then to attendees. We're hoping that, well, no, first of all, we have a confirmed meeting coming up for Uzbekistan in the middle of this table. This is interesting because it's been many, many years since we've had activity on this file, but now all the documents are in place and um, we have a date, the 7th of July. So um, this will be very interesting. Then we have Comoros and Timo Leste, who are also candidates for holding a working party meeting in the near future. The uh, documents that are necessary for holding a meeting are in place or largely in place. So, um, somewhere in this quarter, hopefully, at least one of these two will have the next meeting. And as you can see from this table for Belarus, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Azerbaijan and Ethiopia, we're hopeful that there'll be also uh, activity physically in Geneva or virtually, <laughs> uh, but in the second half of the year. So um, these are, the immediate prospects where we expect to have active uh, work substantively on accessions. For several other files, things can happen at any point. So the fact that it says to be determined TBD doesn't mean that there won't be anything happening in the next six months. There was a question that we never addressed early on uh, legislation. So legislation was mentioned at the heart of each WTO accession process is um, the review of, of legislation uh, and regulatory practices. So in many cases, to move from one cycle of working party uh, meetings to another, the exceeding government um, does more than just reply to questions. They also try to push through legislative work back home to reform their practices and make them more compliant with the WTO norms. So uh, in many cases, there are perhaps laws that need to be adopted and this would then warrant the submission of inputs and a working party meeting. It does not need to take long in many of these files. 
the countries, the exceeding governments know what they need to do. They just sometimes need time to push through the necessary domestic reforms to then report on those to WTO members so the WTO members can review their accession in a new light and we move forward. So this is what I have to say now. I think the rest of this table speaks for itself. At the bottom, we see the files that have been largely inactive, which we define as no uh, activity at the working party, well, working party meeting activity for the last five years. I'll uh, say just one more thing, which is when, um, when I look, when we look at what is going on in our accession files, accession dossiers, the 23 that we currently have, and the sort of themes that emerge more recently. I'm looking at the period of the last four years, basically four or five years, since we had the last accessions of Liberia and Afghanistan, as we saw earlier, how th things are different in this period. So, I mean, for me, the, the new themes that have emerged in this latest period of WTO accession is that now we've had a focus on activations and reactivations. Many governments have shown either interest or renewed interest in the WTO. For a while, we've had many dormant files, inactive files. This has tended to change now. There's been this uh, a bit of a snowball effect where we had many governments asking for accession, including now during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had renewed activity in many files, somewhat surprisingly. We've had a number of resumptions. You can see quite a few, actually, since 2016. Comoros, Belarus, Sudan, Bosnia, Bahamas, Ethiopia, Uzbekistan. So this is uh, what's happening in accessions. Countries are getting on the journey. They're at the uh, uh, populating <laughs> the initial stages. We don't have much coming out, but we'll get there. At some point, all this renewed interest and activity will lead to um, definitive outcomes. Then um, looking at the sort of group of countries and the issues they raise, we realize that there is also an increased role for technical assistance. Many of those uh, that are joining the relative latecomers uh, require more capacity building to be able to sustain the accession processes and the reforms that are um, underpinning each WTO accession. So the role of technical assistance has grown uh, in its importance Fortunately, we've seen uh, that WTO members, bilateral donors, as well as multilateral donors, has also upped the level of interest and support. Um, so here are just some examples of, of institutions that have been supportive. And again, WTO members are also uh, supportive of the accession process. And finally, another theme that has emerged is fragility and conflict. Many of the exceeding governments that we currently have in accession actually come from this background of fragility and conflict. Um, so for them, we've come to realize WTO accession is, uh, uh, in addition to you know, uh, a tool for attracting foreign direct investment, uh, and increased trade is also seen as an engine of peace and stability. So it's a, it's a different new, it's a different theme, interesting new theme that has also uh, emerged and in many ways has been reaffirmed through this renewed interest from fragile and uh, conflict affected states. So I'll stop here and see if there are any interesting questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dimitar. Um, I'm looking at the question. I think there's some interest on, let's say, on Uzbekistan. So let me uh, probably explain a little bit. Uh, so Uzbekistan's accession, like uh, many of the former Soviet republics, it started in the, you know, soon after the dissolution of the uh, you know, Soviet Union. So I think Uzbekistan started 1994, like Belarus started 1993. So many of these uh, republics started accession around more or less uh, same time. Uh, in the case of Uzbekistan, after a bit of a slow start, uh, meaning the table in the initial documentation of uh, MFTR, which is the initial document, um, and I think they had about a three working party in a sort of a, you know, short period. Then I think his last meeting was held in 2005. Since then, process became uh, dormant although there were some progress in, in early 2007, 2008 in concluding bilateral market access negotiation. And after that, not much has happened till 
um, I think in 2016, 2017, where the new president, uh, you know, I think basically looking to, you know, first of all, place that re reform as a very much important part of the agenda. Uh, and then wanted to see a WTO accession process uh, restarted as a vehicle to basically anchor the reform. So we, meaning the WTO Secretary Accession Division, we have been working with Uzbekistan for the, I would say about last two years, with a view to prepare, you know, entire new documentation set for resumption, which, um, Dimitar explained, um, you know, it, it's, you know, when there's a break, it's actually quite uh, difficult to restart, uh, not just because you probably, you know, rebuild the entire documentation set based on which was submitted more than 10 years ago, uh, but of course there will be a change in the, obviously, the people, so you kind of have to start everything um, from the beginning, from the scratch. So that's exactly what happened with Uzbekistan. Uh, but since the last summer, uh, Uzbekistan tabled, um, you know, revised MFTR, and then has submitted other required documentation, checklist, and, you know, a questionnaire, and now we have it complete. Uh, so, I think the question is how long could it take for Uzbekistan to get um, membership? Uh, I don't think I would like to be in a position to make a prediction. Uh, I let you to look at the next set of slides where you, we actually talk about, you know, average length of WTO accession. Um, I mean, it has already been doing this for, you know, quite a number of the years. But we believe, at least I believe, I have seen um, you know, very strong commitment from the government of Uzbekistan, just to give you an indication for the next working party meeting, which is basically scheduled next week, Deputy Prime Minister is going to lead a delegation. Of course, he'll be connecting virtually. And then I do expect a large number of uh, senior government officials will be participating. So it's very much depends on the political will, which drives and decide, determine the pace of our accession. So um, I think probably we will be in a much better position to see once this uh, resumption of the working party, which takes place next, place, uh, next week, uh, and see uh, what is the level of commitment from the government and also the level of the, from the WTO members. Um, okay, I think other questions a little bit linked to like lens of accession, uh, including my bilateral market access negotiation, which probably be better answered uh, after the following presentation, in my view. Yes, I'll be covering these issues hopefully yes. in the coming slides. And I don't see any you know, question on specific accession in the current uh, acceding government. So I think we could move to the next, last part of your presentation. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, what is expected of acceding governments? Um, what I'm showing you in this slide is some ranges, yardsticks. As you recall, I started with an explanation of Article 12 saying how a key element of Article 12 is that each accession is on terms to be agreed. So um, there are various unique outcomes. Here we just see the ranges of these outcomes in, uh, in some areas. I mean, already the actual length of negotiations can vary significantly. We have, uh, as you see, from three years, close three years to close 20 years from the date of application. The accession commitments, which are the um, legally binding texts that exceeding governments agreed to, in addition to the uh, core WTO provisions that were agreed by WTO members, the specific commitments that each exceeding government also uh, incorporates um, to
to to its uh, through its accession protocol uh, in as a WTO member and um, you can see that these also can vary significantly. We have from 17 to 163 such commitment paragraphs. On the side of tariffs as well, you see a lot of variation uh, on the side of domestic support to agriculture as well. There are various indicators there that I won't discuss in detail now unless they're very specific questions, uh, de minimis levels, uh, AMS levels, export subsidies, etc. Uh, I'll this is just a snapshot. I'll show you some visual information in the coming slides so that you understand a bit better or perhaps process some of this information uh, more easily. Before I do that though, just to mention at the outset, when it comes to yardsticks, we have the precedent that has been established, which is what I just showed you in the previous slide, the sort of outcomes that we've seen through these 36 individual accession processes but we also have, in the case of least developed country accessions, we have a set of guidelines that have been agreed by the WTO members. And these guidelines are contained in a document called WTL 508, which has been in place in its amended version since, since uh, 2012, its complete version. And uh, this document covers four pillars, market access, WTO rules, the accession process and technical assistance. And in each of these pillars, um, it provides guidelines as to how these developed country accessions should be um, approached by all parties concerned. So if there are any questions on this, we can, uh, we can go into this in a bit more detail but I just wanted to straight away provide you this additional set of yardsticks that have been uh, in place for these developed countries for a number of years now. Now, back to those charts that I said would help you visualize uh, what I'm trying to convey uh, in terms of yardsticks. First of all, the length of accession process. Sometimes it looks very daunting when we say 20 years. In fact, when you look more closely, the reality is it's not that uh, that uh, bad. On average, after the first accession working party is held, or from the day the first working party uh, meeting is held, it takes six years and seven months to complete an accession process with major variation. But still, uh, I think this is quite encouraging for a government that is at the start of the process. Um, this could almost be done within one electoral cycle <laughs> in some cases. So uh, this incidentally explains why we have such long processes in some cases, just because domestic, the domestic situation uh, changes. They, uh, the processes need to be restarted all the time. The teams change. So sometimes it can last a very long time, but it can also be done in short bursts of activity uh, in just a few years. As you can see, the average for least developed countries is uh, a bit shorter, five years and four months. These are the headline figures that you often see um, that the average is more like 10 years. This is of course from the moment the, uh, the application is filed. And those initial years sometimes are just not used very productively, shall we say, by the exceeding governments. The word begins in earnest once the memorandum on the foreign trade regime is submitted. And a few months later, the first working party meeting takes place in many cases. So this is just, you know, sometimes a bit intimidating, but I think what you should keep in mind is more this figure of six or five years in the case of LDCs. Um, what else when it comes to expectations? Well, here we've plotted all the tariff commitments on agriculture that exceeding governments, the 36 of them, have undertaken uh, in accessions. Again, these are averages for each individual uh, member. So on average, Ecuador exceeded to the WTO with tariff bindings at 25.5%. This is what this says in a simplified way. You can probably notice two or three things on all these slides, this one and the next one. Here we're looking at agricultural products, then we'll look at non-agricultural products or industrial products. 
you can see that perhaps the first four or five accessions are not that representative of the overall trend that follows. These were still early days. We're looking at 95, 96. In many ways, these were just follow-up discussions to the discussions that took place during the Uruguay round. They're just some accessions could not be completed on time for the for the, for them to become original WTO members. So this was just a leftover. Not particularly, I think, informative when it comes to comparisons with later practices that have emerged in accessions. I think, by and large, the situation is quite homogenous uh, since then, arguably. Uh, the spikes that you see, for example, 33.7% Afghanistan, uh, Vanuatu 43%, what do we have here, Nepal 41 these uh, are associated invariably with least developed country accessions. So uh, you can see this is in a way a reflection of the framework that has been used by WTO members when treating these developed country accession uh, dossiers that uh, there is more um, the, the, the tariff bindings that have been agreed have been higher on average. So there is more uh, leeway in a way in the negotiations. All the other readings that are lower are for non least developed countries. And they're not that different on average. When you have from 17.5%, say for Estonia, to 10% uh, for Tajikistan, I'm just picking countries at, at, at random, but you can see where the yardsticks are. Of course, again, these are averages that hide thousands and thousands of individual lines. There'll be more on this topic uh, tomorrow in the next session, session three, where our colleagues dealing with tariff issues will uh, highlight perhaps some of these trends in uh, greater detail. But this gives a sense of what can be expected. Similarly for non-agricultural products, I think the same story unfolds. We have on the one hand, the early accessions, on the other hand, the least developed country accessions, the developing countries accessions, I forgot to mention, also tend to be a bit higher. And then finally, um, all the other uh, accessions. For services, it's very difficult to, to speak about averages, not just in services, also for goods, what we just saw with tariffs, because sometimes products of interest can be uh, protected at a very high level, those that are actually traded. So one needs the complete information. And this is even more uh, difficult when it comes to reading services commitments here. We've attempted to do that. Um, services, what we call subsectors for analytical purposes, uh, we have 160 of those subsectors. And you can see that in accession, um, countries, exceeding governments tend to uh, make commitments in over a hundred or about a hundred subsectors on average out of a possible 160. Again, what's interesting to see is how much commitment there is in each of those sectors. What is the depth, which this doesn't tell you. We need to, to look at a country by country basis, but it does provide you the general yardsticks yet again. Um, more data that you can look at later, uh, that you can uh, perhaps be guided by how many questions and replies, how many questions you can see we have from hundreds to thousands, the amount of questions that each exceeding government has to answer. This is sometimes purely a reflection of the length of a process and not uh, the difficulty of a process, perhaps. Sometimes negotiations need to be restarted over and over again because for domestic reasons, uh, delinked from the actual accession negotiations, countries disappear for a number of years, then they come back to the table and members need to ask the same questions to restart the process. And finally, going back to legislation, you can see the amount of legislation that we've managed to track based, based on the documents that we, we, we have at our disposal in accessions. How many uh, documents have been submitted, uh, legislative texts. In some cases, we have thousands. In most cases, more like dozens. Um, this is interesting, this one. It's legislation enacted. We've also tracked how much legislation has been produced as a result of accession negotiations, or at least has been reported to the WTO linked to trade 
uh, matters. So you can see that this really illustrates how the accession process at its heart is a process of legislative reform. Um, you can also see how over time, this perhaps has become more prominent. I'm not sure if these are labeled. Yes, these are broadly speaking labeled, uh, ordered in uh, by years of accession from 96. Oh no, I'm wrong, sorry. This is not all the time. Excuse me. And going back to the number of commitments that each exceeding government has to undertake, when we, um, if we choose not to look at the spikes, which perhaps outliers, uh, China accession and the Russian Federation accession with an extraordinary uh, amount of specific commitment that were negotiated, I think being a reflection of the economic uh, size, the importance of these economies and the interests of trading partners, all these interests were also reflected in those commitments and perhaps the level of scrutiny was higher um, when we're looking at above 160 specific commitments that we negotiated. Um, and Kazakhstan, in a way, uh, as Ambassador Janova highlighted in the earlier session, the linkages between the accession of Kazakhstan and the accession of the Russian Federation, because they're bound in a customs union together, which also explains the large amount of commitments. Everything else is perhaps, I, I notice two phases. There is the phase before 2005 and the phase since 2005. On average, up to 2005, there are about 30 specific commitments that uh, exceeding governments would have to undertake. And since then, we've perhaps moved closer to, to, to 40. Uh, a few more have been added. Um, to just give you a sense of what these specific commitments are about, they're about conformity with WTO rules. And these are the areas that are examined in each accession, which also typically have um, WTO agreements or WTO provisions, legal provisions that are linked to those topics. Um, and you can see that there are many, many commitments in a, in a few areas that's very common, such as sanitary and phytosanitary measures and technical barriers to trade, intellectual property. And in some areas, there are very few, uh, perhaps a reflection uh, of the specific dynamics of that specific accession negotiation. But yeah, uh, uh, even exceeding government is looking today as to what to expect. One can say for certain that they'll have to have a commitment on intellectual property, technical barriers to trade, sanitary and sanitary measures. There is this whole uh, discussion out there about the commitments in accession going beyond the standard commitments for original members. And it is true uh, that in accession, by definition, we have commitments which are not do not exist for original members. 1,500 commitments, more than 1,500 commitments have been added uh, to the WTO rule book, if you will, through WTO accessions. These are the individual commitments undertaken by each of the 36 Article 12 members, the ones that I showed you here, when you add them up. Um, they have been tailored to individual circumstances, but also over time, we've seen that patterns have emerged. So, um, these WTO plus commitments are adding obligations which are building on the existing WTO agreements. So in a way they've been the counterpart to uh, what's been happening at the multilateral level. And I've given a couple of examples there. Uh, WTO members have successfully agreed to the trade facilitation agreement. It's been enforced since 2017. But in accessions, we have not waited, members have not waited to agree with exceeding governments on, uh, on this in 2017. Throughout the accession process, they've been asking questions in that direction. They've been obtaining specific commitments on transparency. And I've listed the um, 37 specific commitments uh, that are just dedicated on transparency in accession party reports, plus another 200 or more that are individual sections also linked to transparency issues. And many of these elements you find as of 2017 as the new norm for the entirety of the WTO membership. Similarly, an example with agriculture export subsidies in 2015, WTO members agreed to eliminate 
the use of agricultural export subsidies. In accessions, Mexican governments have been asked to do so and have agreed to do so since 96. So um, just to say that all these interests that are being explored at the multilateral level are also explored in accessions. And in each successfully completed accession, they're typically also reflected in the commitments. So yes, one could look at it as WTO plus, but at the same time, this is the direction in which the system itself is moving, albeit more slowly uh, in any case. Um, so the question is what we have produced in accessions as a, a key accomplishment. Will it set the stage for future negotiations at the multilateral level? Because they're putting additional pressure to level the playing field for all. As I mentioned before, one third of Occident governments have come through this with similar commitments. Is this adding to the pressure for the, to the entire membership to, to, to bring up the level in the same direction? Well, probably yes. Uh, we, we don't know, we will see, but this is the, uh, the direction in which we've been moving. I think that we don't have too much time left. Um, I have a couple of slides looking at the aim and rationale of WTO accession, the sort of benefits of accession. Um, why do exceeding governments wish to join the WTO? There are many reasons. When we prepare for these presentations, I think we update these slides every time and every time we just change the points because there are many, many bullet points that make sense here. The latest one to include is, of course, improving economic resilience post COVID-19. And this is, this is a powerful observation that if you're outside of the multilateral trading system, I mean, regardless of the thinking in the current COVID-19 um, environment, I think a case can be made that the decision whether or not to join the WTO is no longer in a way a choice. The overwhelming evidence is that countries join the system. It is perhaps ironic that the system is under a lot of stress currently, but at the same time, with 164 members, the case has been made. Every major economy is in it, and most of the very small economies are also in the WTO. So the system caters for everyone, and the choice is no longer whether or not uh, governments should join the WTO. The question has become when, um, how to sequence the, the accession as part of the uh, economic reform process in countries. So. Um, in that vein, in the current environment, I think it has led many countries to the realization that being outside of the multilateral trading system is going to be detrimental to their economic recovery following um, COVID-19. And certainly membership of the WTO would help build more resilient networks for uh, the future. So this is an additional point. I leave the other ones for you to look at. There are many best practices for accession negotiations and I encourage those interested to, to get in contact with uh, us. We've been observing many negotiations over time and we have gathered some ideas as to what works. Some of these points are listed here. Um, and finally, to say that we offer technical assistance in addition to the technical assistance that's available for multilateral donors and bilateral donors. And these are some of the channels through which our technical assistance is provided. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. So we have a few minutes for questions. If more questions have come in, I'm sure Mike and I will be happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitar. I know this session I had uh, lots of lots of uh, information, and then once again we will definitely share the slides so you actually have a you know opportunity to look at in detail. It's actually it's it's actually very interesting uh, each slide. Okay, so while maybe I give you time to take a quick rest, uh, let me respond to maybe some of the questions which came in and. And then very sorry, I don't think we can respond to all of them because we have a, in total 27 questions has come in. Um, so let me probably pick up a little bit easier one. Uh, so uh, regarding 2002 general 
guideline for LDC accession in 2012, you know, updated this decision. Has the Secretariat conducted any review or evaluation of the actual function of these two decisions? So what I can say is uh, the agenda, um, you know, subcommittee on LDC, which actually annual review LDC accession state of play within that context. Also, I think, um, you know, some sort of analysis of the implementation of our guideline is mentioned. But it's again, this is not so much the secretariat driven exercise. It's very much member driven exercise. But what is, I think, clear is, you know, in 2002, when the, there was a first guideline came, there was no LDC accession concluded since the beginning of, you know, the beginning of WTO. But the, since um, 2002 guideline was put in place, uh, I think nine LDC has uh, joined the WTO. So I do believe that the evidence of uh, this has played a role in facilitating, accelerating uh, LDC accession. Perhaps, Michael, just to very quickly add that uh, in some of the slides I, I shared, you already I mentioned the differences in terms of commitments, level of commitments, be it higher levels of bindings for LDCs, fewer commitment paragraphs negotiated, agreed to yeah. by LDCs. So uh, these are all elements that are covered in the guidelines, incidentally. Mm -hmm. um, and also some of the other elements that are covering the guidelines we haven't discussed today, such as the use of good offices of the chairperson of the subcommittee and uh, working party chairpersons, or um, doing um, yeah, fewer working party meetings to avoid financial pressures. Mm -hmm. All these things have actually been put into practice. So many, many of these things are being done or have been done. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Demita, for that addition. Um, let me just probably pick up the last uh, question, which I actually wanted to ask you, Divitar, because it's also to my interest. Uh, I know that you have not been working in the accession division for 20 years, but uh, still, you have be you, you have you know how the work of the division has evolved at least last 15 years. So there is a one question. Compare with working accession division, you know, 20 years ago, let's say 15 years ago, what is the main change of working in the division now? In a workload, in a return achievement? To you. <laughs> um, some of the perhaps more systemic elements I mentioned under the new themes, the, the kind of work we do now uh, is slightly, the, the, the focus is slightly different because of the countries that are in the pipeline. We have more countries that have high needs for technical assistance. So in a way, we work more closely with them to help them navigate the process than used to be the case in the past. Uh, that's a definite change. There is a renewed emphasis on technical assistance, which also, for example, Accessions Week this week is a new uh, endeavor for us. We thought it was an opportunity to seize in the current environment. But in our activities like this one, we have many. Uh, uh, each year, we try to do one global and one regional activity, focusing on accessions, which is perhaps ironic that now that we have fewer accessions in the pipeline relative to 15 years ago, when we, at any given time, we would have 30 plus accessions today. It's more like 20. Mm -hmm but we actually have to do more to support these processes or we have been doing more. Um, and uh, we have a lot of these activities that are out there and we also try to develop tools to support that uh, and provide additional transparency and additional guidance for those who are interested. So work has changed in that respect that um, we have put the emphasis now um, differently to achieve ultimately the same goal, which is universality of membership. That was the WTO members have set out to do. And we are, of course, the arm, the division is the main arm through which this is done. And the focus is now slightly tweaked, um, but we still achieve results as before. <laughs> At the same rate, similar, similar rate. 
Okay, I think uh, that was sort of a nice sort of concreting remarks for the session two. And since we have, uh, you know, uh, exhausted all the time. And then uh, my apology for not to be able to take up all the question. Actually, some of them are quite detailed and then good ones. And what we would do is we try to respond to you individually. And uh, again, you know, you will have a slide that Dimitar presented. So uh, I hope uh, you have uh, enjoyed this session. Um, we have a good level of participants. 65, well, I think I've seen up to 70, been connecting from a different part. Thank you very much for, very much for joining us. As, as I said in the beginning, this is session two. Uh, so we'll be continuing. Uh, we will have eight more every day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So tomorrow, um, you know, we'll be, focus on, we'll be focusing on the bilateral market access negotiation on goods, basically meaning tariff. Some of the questions we received today was also linked to bilateral market access negotiation. So I would like to invite those who are interested in uh, markets, um, bilateral market access negotiation to also listen um, tomorrow morning, starting at 10 o'clock Geneva time. This will be delivered by our colleagues from uh, market access intelligence a section of economic research. The other one basically is our tariff expert, okay? So and then in the afternoon, um, starting 2.30 Geneva time, we will have a round table. So it's a little bit of a different format. Now, with a roundtable with accession chief negotiators. So this session will be moderated by Ambassador Atanas Paparizo for Bulgaria, uh, who used to be the chief negotiator of uh, Bulgaria's accession to the WTO, which happened in 1996. Uh, what is great about him is that he's uh, currently the chairperson of the Working Party on uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is, by the way, it's the closest to completion. So, you know, he knows how accession made it happen and he, he's trying to um, learn, bring that experience as a chairperson of the working party. So we will have our speakers uh, from um, Afghanistan, former chief negotiator, Mr. Mus Shinwari, who used to be the deputy minister of trade and industry of Afghanistan. Uh, by the way, Afghanistan is, Afghanistan is the latest addition to the WTO, joined the WTO in July 2016. And another speaker we will have from Curacao. As uh, Dimitar explained, Curacao is the latest, you know, newest acceding government. The chief negotiator, Mr. Monte, will be joining us from uh, Curacao, Caribbean. And then a uh, third speaker, uh, is a Miss Cecilia Klein, and those who has done the accession must have uh, come across her name many times. She used to be the uh, U.S. Uh, accession negotiator. She has worked on accession probably about 30 years. So she will be joining us from uh, Washington. So with this, um, I hope to see uh, probably some of you in other session. And then thank you once again uh, for joining us and big thanks to Dimitar for the presentation. Thank you. <laughs>